Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Indigenous Insights. I'm your host Stephanie Williams. As a proud Latakia and Iwaja woman living on Nam, you may have seen me around. I have done AFLW in my past career of sporting. I've played for Geelong Football Club and I've also played for Richmond. Um, these days you'll find me around in community, doing a lot of community events or if not um, working as an Aboriginal liaison officer and studying in uni. Um, I've also played footy at a VFLW level and I play at Collingwood. So that's a bit about me. But today we are interviewing Marissa Williamson Pullman. I'm so excited. In fact, I'm even a bit nervous, but more so excited because we've got some ecstatic news about her journey and where she's at and where she's going and how she's representing mob and community and her people at a very high level at the Olympics. So how exciting. Here she is. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the um, land of the Wadanjeti Wadadang people of the Gulenya Nation. Pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, Yeah, 30 days out until Paris. So it's all happening. Can you talk a little bit about, I suppose, um, what that means to you, that connection to community Mm -hmm. and how that's also, I suppose, kept you grounded? Yeah, I guess like being an Aboriginal child, going through out-of-home care and being a ward of the state, I guess not exactly connected to my mob, but being supported by a very staunch um, and resilient group of people really helped me get through a lot of hard times. And um, I think a lot of those people in community really just stood by me and yeah. made, made sure I didn't fail. And I think... Um, I sort of identify with Yudinji and Kondamuka because of my foster mum. Yeah. She fostered me at the age of 18. It's a long story, but, you know, she was an old social worker working at Vaco and she sort of took me in when I was homeless. So um, really grateful to have been raised by a black woman, mm-hmm. um, which isn't something that I can say, you know, going through white foster homes and things like that. So, yeah. That's such an amazing story and, um, yeah, just shows that it takes, you know, like what people say, community in a village to raise raise a child, but, you know, community really did raise you and um, moulded you to be that young person and the athlete and the woman you are now. So, I think my mum said something, like my foster mum said something the other day. She said, like, I guess my success is a testament of what Aboriginal children can achieve yeah. when they're supported by a community. So, yeah. Yeah. It's so, yeah, it's that wonderful beautiful story to you know give a lot of young people some hope um that you know community and you're relying on the people around you and to get some strength and to be able to yeah like I said keep grounded and um adds to that success and you know success is achieved in many different ways and it's not always a linear you know path and especially that athletic journey um is never linear but you're definitely that testament that Success can be seen in many different ways and achieved in many different ways. So, like, congratulations, sis. Take a minute to just appreciate that in you. It's been, yeah, it's been such a hectic journey. And like you said, it's been nonlinear. Like, I started started my athletic journey, like, doing running and yeah. um, sprinting and things like that. And then I sort of was trying to get back into an old school that I had left because um, I wanted to graduate. I had to sign a behavioural contract and... That's when my principal at the time got me a gig training with Geelong Falcons and that's how we sort of met. I got, you know, the opportunity to play for Victorian Kickstart and yep. Broomall and I sort of just randomly got into boxing. It was just a gym for at-risk youth in the western suburbs that one of the backer workers, Arnie Donna, sort of um, encouraged me to go to um, and I just – something about it that I loved um, and, yeah – Shortly after that, hung up the boots and five years later, heading yep. to my first Olympics. So That is amazing. And um, viewers listening, Marissa and I know each other from, I suppose, doing a bit of, you know, footy with each other as youngins. But, you know, she'd always been such a powerful athlete um, and strong. So, you know, she, and she said she had a passion for, not a passion, but she enjoyed boxing. And I think at that start... You just said you were only just starting then. Um, so, yeah, it's quite wonderful to see how 
where that journey has taken you and like just the heights you've gone to. But obviously it's probably been a very long journey and yeah, we'll get into that, what that looked like. But yeah, training also would have been a bit different for you too and fueling and how did you navigate that, I suppose, um, in those times? There's de- def- there's definitely been levels to the training, I guess. Like at that level, it was more so out of joy and passion and just the love of learning something new and being able to fight with no consequence because obviously yeah. I was fighting a lot. And I guess when I was playing footy, it was more so playing players instead of playing the game, like yeah. just sort of just bumping players off really. Yeah. Um, so that's why I kind of made that transition. Um, but now it's sort of after making the Australian team, um, after winning my first elite Australian title, um, everything sort of changed and things became more professional and <clears throat> travelled to like over 10 countries last year with yeah, the sport, yep. um, training with the best athletes in the world. Yep. Um, so I really had to like really like take a step back and think, okay, if I need to do this, it's going to take a lot of sacrifice and yep. um, a lot of grit and just discipline and yeah. And for a moment there, I was like, fuck, do I want to actually do this? Like, it's a lot. Yeah. Um, it make, The sport makes you and breaks you, but I guess I decided just to keep at it. And <clears throat> I've been training six days a week, 13 yeah, wow. to 17 times a week yeah. um, for the last, you know, year and a half. Yeah. Um, so this year we've travelled to, with the, with the Australian team, we've travelled to Canberra at the AAS, yeah. um, Germany, America the Netherlands and the UK and shortly we'll be going joining the team next week um, for the last bit of preparation in Queensland and then fly out again to Germany for two weeks before catching the train to Paris and joining the rest of Team Australia in the village. So That's so amazing. When did you know that it's gone from now a passion and a hobby to now also a passion and I actually think I want to do this at a really elite level and it's become really serious like when did that kind of take a turn I think the turning point started like probably two years ago when I won because I won a youth nationals in 2019 but then obviously you know leaving care happened and global pandemic happened and I was sort of at another gym kickboxing gym for a period of time and ended up living above the gym because I was homeless so um I got a third coach Cal Bryant <clears throat> and he he has done, like, he has achieved so much in the sport as a coach. Like, he's had 17 Australian champions out of his gym. He's been running the Collingwood Boxing Gym as a non-for-profit for 25 years. So wow. when I started training with him and within the year of training with him, we had won our first elite Australian title against someone who had won a silver world medal at one point. So I think after that, making the Australian team and then – beating somebody who was undefeated in Australia for over 10 years at yep. the final to qualify for a spot at the Pacific Games and being the first woman that that year to win the Arthur Tunstall Trophy, which is awarded to the best boxer of yeah. the Australian Championships. Amazing. And the reason why women weren't eligible for the award is because Arthur Tunstall believed women shouldn't be doing sport. And yep. he was sort of on Kathy Freeman's case yep. um, during the 2000 Olympics for carrying the flag. So it seemed like a massive statement and I guess – Securing my spot to fight for a, an Olympic quota spot at the Pacific Games, I was like, okay, if I can get this over the line, like, I have a chance. I'm going to run it all the way up. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. That is, yeah, that is so amazing. And do you know of any kind of like tools or strategies that you really found helped kind of when your mind was going elsewhere and you, um, you know, the external outside of being in the boxing ring, like a lot of stuff happening in your life at the time. Like you said, you've just come out of out of home care at that age, mm-hmm. around 18, 19, and that's when it started to become serious to you at the same time. So in that transitional phase, like what kept you really grounded? Look, it's been a journey and it's been like, it's like you said, it's been non-linear. Like definitely everyone has coping mechanisms and some of mine weren't positive, like, yep. to get that straight. Like, there were a lot of negative ones. Like, I had a pretty significant suicide attempt that was pretty awful. Um, <clears throat> but I guess I – I don't know why I just kind of cling to hope and I think maybe the sport was a reason as well. Yeah. But I guess 
really just being f- so for real with myself and being like, I need to get therapy and I need to be on medication. Yeah. I need like a good support team, you yeah. know, my coach. I need to have an open dialogue with him. He knows everything about me, unfortunately, for him, the good, the bad, the ugly. So um, my, now, my now foster parents, you know, if I didn't, if I wasn't courageous enough to send them that message, be like, hey, I'm homeless, can I come live with you? Um, yeah. I don't know where exactly I would be now. But I guess my coping mechanisms, now that I've matured and I've unpacked a lot of trauma and I'm more secure with uh, with myself, like as a person mm-hmm. and as an athlete, yeah. like I'm going to regular therapy, I've been on medication for five years, like yeah. I have an amazing support team. I'm really comfortable with my small circle. So it's been like a lot and it's went from rock bottom to like yeah. what I am now. So it's just taken a lot of work, to be yeah. honest. Oh, that's amazing that you'd be able to identify what works well for you and it's, you know, obviously contributed to your success and where you are now and speaks volumes that, you know, you've come out of such a really tough time but being able to, you know, still reach that, what you wanted to reach, the success and, you know, in that boxing ring and be able to, you know, switch on and it's just amazing, sis. I'm just so blown away with your journey and just you in general and like yeah don't get me wrong like there's still been hard times like I have a deep trauma history like I'm a black follower and that like attached to that is cultural and community responsibility Mm. that you can't you know turn your back on or I physically like I literally just cannot turn my back on so yeah and like boxing is a weight making sport so coming from history of like family violence and Mm. food insecurity and things like that like I have had like an eating disorder sort of manifest and um barge into my life so like it's been it peaks and troughs and um like I'm just a human as well so I'm not going to be 100% all of the time but at least I can acknowledge that I am having a hard day or a hard time and I can seek the right support to like get through it and keep on keeping on really yeah, that's right. And seeking those supports. And I think, I suppose, as Aboriginal women, are not oft, sometimes we do and sometimes we don't, but it, there's that big shame stigma at times too with mob and young mob too. And you really, in seeking that, you're also like breaking those stigmas as well. And so hopefully, you know, this that's just a you know, great representation for other young people to be able to speak out and seek the supports when they need to, your story and... um you know, also not to be shame and that, you know, you can still have pride in yourself when you're seeking supports mm. and still be proud and still be proud, staunch black woman and still seek those supports. Mm. And I think, you know, you've really eloquently kind of shown that by telling your story. So, yeah, thanks, sis. Thank you. Thank you so much. So what does it mean? I think that kind of ties in really well with this question. What does it mean to you to be the first Aboriginal woman to qualify for the Australian Olympic team in boxing? Oh, it just feels like really strange and like I'm like it's honestly hard to believe because it's like how? Like how has there never been one before? But also like everything that I've been through, the journey that I've been on and like the process that I've taken – it's also not much of a surprise that it was going to be me. Yeah. Um, I'm really proud. Obviously, that's come with its own challenges, like the way that I look, having a history of um, family disconnection and being descendant of stolen generation and mm-hmm. the hate that comes from black fellas and white fellas and it's a lot. Yeah. Um, it's a lot to deal with. But also, like, the impact that I think I've made on young people's lives, like, the letters I've received, the messages, like the people that I've met and just physically seeing how I've impacted their lives, it makes it worth it to me. Yeah. Um, but it is hard. It's, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a strange sort of feeling. It's like positive, but it's also a lot of na- like negative stuff that I have to like navigate through. You know, so it's such a burden to carry at times, but you're just, you know, so mature in your way of thinking when you approach, like, different situations and things. Like, I feel like you just know yourself really well and in knowing yourself, that journey of knowing yourself, do you think it's taken a lot of time? I think for me, like, 
like living in out of home care for so long, having like no connection to my family, but somehow have made my way to like the Victorian Aboriginal community and sort of been raised in that way. Um, I can I can resonate with how young people have felt because I I have been that that young person where like even when we we're playing footy I just remember like having a, like a yarning circle and I've you know told you all that I've you know I don't have any family and that you know, I'm in care and how hard that was for me and um, you know I had a suicide attempt from every year from 13 to 19 and so I've I've definitely been in the trenches and um, even now like not every day is going to be a good day. Like sometimes I just want to like punch holes in walls because life yep. is hard. Yep. And sometimes you do have a bad day and you really question your identity and what the hell you're doing and that's just like the human experience. But I go back to the people that are in my life that have really guided me through everything. Yep. You know, my foster mum who's a very staunch black woman. Um, yeah. My foster dad who's just like he's just – the best and obviously my coach Kel who knows everything about me which is unfortunate um so um yeah yeah thank you so much and I think that's just great insight to get for a lot of young people but even for myself when I'm sitting here I feel like I'm learning as well from yourself and just hearing your journey but also just like tools and strategies you've used that have also their life strategies that people can use as a young person and it resonates for young Aboriginal women but then also um, that athletic background too as well like at an athlete perspective when you're going through those tough times like those are the great strategies like you can use um, mm-hmm. to keep you yeah to keep you grounded whilst I guess like being in care you know the reason why I did sport was to yeah. stay out of the house like to stay out of the shit placements that I was in, the shit situations that I were in. Yeah. It was like literally a coping mechanism and like a survival strategy. Yeah. So it's – but also the responsibility needs to be on like adults yeah. that should be taking this responsibility on and supporting young people, not just clapping for them when they've achieved something great or made it. Like I wish more people cared yep. and more people supported me before yep. I was at this – point in my life yeah yeah so it's like a bit of you know reaching those supports but then also you know reflecting on the journey that a lot of that time you were doing it on your own as well too and you know being having to really ground yourself in who you were in Mm. yeah and knowing yourself but so you identify as a queer black woman and we didn't really touch on that that much because, yeah, I don't know, we just got straight into the interview, so sorry, we'll get back there. So what does that feel like to be identified as a queer black woman um, with the pronouns and your, so your preferred pronouns are she, they, and that's another community that you represent well and and how do you feel like you have to, I suppose, go about representing yourself as a queer black woman but then also just in the sport as well Mm. but then also just in day-to-day life Mm. to be honest it's nothing that's really it's not really something that's impacted me in a negative way like I was speaking about this on another podcast but I never really had to come out (laughs) because I didn't have any family to come out to and I didn't really like think there was anything wrong about liking women or non-binary folk because I didn't have parents to tell me, you know, that was the wrong thing. Um, So it's sort of like a really interesting sort of thing to go through now as an adult where there is stigma. Um, And to be honest, it was sort of like a a more of a personal journey because I was like, oh, I'm an athlete. I'm, you know, physically strong. Am I a mask? Am I a lesbian? (laughs) Yeah. But it's like it's – so it's been a learning journey for me. Um, But also it's really – it opens your eyes when you go travelling international – with the boxing team and you go to countries where it's illegal to be homosexual. And so I find it like a very fascinating part of my life. But yeah, yeah, I feel like we're really lucky to be living in Australia and I think people are becoming more and more accepting and... Yeah, wonderful. Well, Melbourne's a bit of a bubble. Everyone's sort of gay here. So it's... But yeah. That's wonderful. Um, 
Yeah, so definitely the only times you've really been confronted with, you say, is more so when you've travelled overseas to those 10 countries that you spoke with, 10 countries, um, doing boxing. Mm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's amazing. Mm. Even 10 countries. So, and that's in the past three years you've travelled to 10 countries? I've been to more. That was just last year. Like, wow. I think I've been to like 15 countries now. Yeah, wow. So in one year you went to 10 countries. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. She is international. She's Mrs. Worldwide. Yes, I'm yeah. worldwide. She is worldwide. <laughs> Could you share someone uh, in your life who has been a source, inspiration or support during your challenging times? Like, is there a one person that stands out or is just that community that you've spoken about? It's definitely, like, there's obviously multiple people. Like, it's hard to, like, pick one, but obviously my coach, Cal, um, yeah. Obviously, our relationship's a bit more special because we have, we're have we passionate about the exact same thing, <laughs> like yeah. boxing. We love boxing. We live, breathe it. So, yeah. so I met I met Cal. So I was with my second boxing coach. I met him, James Rosler, at the Youth Nationals. Um, he sort of could kind of tell that I was a little bit, you know, um, uneasy. And he was like, where are your parents? And I was like, don't have any. He's like, where's your coach? And I was like, don't have one. And he was like, what the hell are you doing here? Like at the youth nationals without a coach, you know, um, he's like, oh, you can um, I've run a kickboxing gym. Yeah, well. I'm in Hoppers Crossing. Um, feel free to um, come train out of there. And then eventually he let me live at the top of it. Um, <clears throat> and then after the lockdown sort of lifted, he was like, yeah, I think, I think you're, you're a boxer and you're a pretty good boxer so I think yeah. you need to go to a You're boxing coach yeah <laughs> um, a traditional boxing coach so I had three names on the list and I was like this needs to be the one because I've had I'm not gonna have a fourth or fifth or sixth coach it's just not gonna happen I'll just yeah. give it up yeah wow so there was Cal Bryan <clears throat> on top and I did my first trial with him mm. um and there was just something about him that I liked I liked the way that he taught boxing, yeah. the way that he spoke. You know, he did 44 years in the military, so he just swore like a trooper. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't like, he just did not care. It was just yeah. all he, like, thought about was boxing. He taught boxing, like, the science of it, and I just was just mesmerised by him. Yeah. So called up the other two coaches, and I was like, no need, fellas. Um, <clears throat> well, we've had a really long journey together. Like, I had a really significant suicide attempt um, at 19 and he picked me up from the hospital and he was sort of like, we need a, something needs to change here. Yeah. Um, so got into my own little apartment in Carlton, lived mm-hmm. there for 18 months, got solitude and he just knows everything about me. Like I can speak to him about anything, um, yeah, without judgment. And yeah. I think I need someone like, like everyone needs a person like that. Yeah. He's been running the calling of boxing gyms literally two minutes away from here. Yeah. Um, for twenty five years as a like non for profit, oldest boxing gym in Australia. Yeah. It's the building's heritage listed um now. Um but yeah, he's amazing. So I like yeah. I yeah, he's literally changed my life. Oh that's great, sis. It's always like do you think with that individual sport and that relationship with your coach was is different to that team sport coach relationship? Absolutely. In many different ways, yeah. Like AFL, like playing for footy with the girls, it was like you can just bump off each other, you yeah. know. If you're having a shit day like, and someone else is like they're positive, most of the team positive or whatever, yeah. you just bump off each other and it's a lot different like and it's less of a personal attack on you. It's like more of an attack on the team if you're getting told off or, you know, getting drilled. Um, but <clears throat> in boxing it's an individual sport. Yeah. And – Hell's in my pocket, like, 24-7. Yeah. Like, he's the first person to message me in the morning, last person to message me at night. I see him, like, six hours a day yep. or more. <laughs> yeah. And so, like, there are punch-ons. Like, sometimes yeah. we have disagreements and, like, yep. sometimes he gets on my nerve and I get on his and um, yep. it's really hard, like, um, like, navigating that space of, like, I have to deliver and trust everything that he has taught me yeah. Tells me everything um, because I'm in the ring by myself, but I have to trust in the things that he's taught me as well in the same token. So yeah. it's been a very, it's a very interesting sport to be part of, to say the least. Yeah. And things yeah. like when you change, because it's an individual sport, things like diet and nutrition and 
if you ever change up your diet or want to try something new, is that something that you'll have to go back to and talk to your coach about more so um, because it has a massive effect or does it have a massive effect is what I should be asking. Yeah, like boxing is a weight-making sport and I guess because Olympics is it's the pinnacle of international sport. Yeah. So to make it even more challenging to be an Olympian, yeah. they take out weight divisions. So usually there's every weight division and it goes up by three yep. kilos, but at the Olympics there's only 50, 54 57, 60, 66, 75. Yeah, wow. So I have to make the 66 division. I've got to weigh in under 66 and I have got to weigh in every day of competition. Yeah. I'm going to be fighting four times at the Olympics. So four times I'll have to weigh in. Yeah. And I have to watch my weight all year round. Like, yeah, wow. I have to weigh myself every second day all year round. Yeah. So <clears throat> obviously as I've gotten like more, become more of an elite athlete, like there's more support people. Like I have a nutritionist that I check in yeah. with. Um but obviously yeah, it's challenging, like, when I was playing footy, like, I can eat protein, I can eat as much carbs as I want, like, yeah. to fuel my sessions and fuel my performance. But with boxing, it's like, you're on, like, 900 calories a day and yeah. it's like, you're hungry all the time and you have to, you still have to perform. Um, so it's probably one of the hardest things about the sport, to be honest. Yeah, that sounds, so, like, even if you're one kilo out of side of that range, you just don't qualify. Even 100 don't. grams, like, if you're yeah. 66.1. Yeah, 0.1, yeah. No. See ya, yeah. Yeah. So that's such a, yeah, gee, that is so, it would be so tough, but then also at the same time so rewarding when you you make it. Do you ever get, like, a sigh of relief whenever you've weighed in? Yeah, just this first sip of water and I just, like, down the whole bottle because I'm, like, that yeah. thirsty because, like, you carb deplete, no, yeah. like, no salt, no electrolytes, yeah. no even no water um, at times, like, when you're having to do a big cut. Yeah. It just depends on what your body's doing. So, but I guess the relief, like, like, like I said, it's, like, it's an individual sport. All the pressure is on you. It's a very yeah. high-pressure environment. Yeah. Someone is literally trying to knock your block off. Yeah. It's a lot of training. Um, a lot of dieting, a lot of sacrifice. Yep. But when your hand is raised in the air and you get that medal, it's like <sighs> relief. I did it. It's yeah. all been worth it. Like you just forget about the, everything. Yeah. Um, like athletes only see one colour and it's gold. Like that medal is like worth every bit of, I don't know what it's about. Like I don't know what's wrong with athletes. We just love yep. that feeling of like validation and, all of that when we win. Like, yeah. Feels so good. I love seeing your, your eyes light up when you've said the word gold. So, so excited for you to get to the Olympics. And yeah, it looks, you can see it in the eyes. There's a lot of excitement. So, well, Harry, like, Harry Garza had, he, he broke a 33 year medal drought for Australia at the last Olympics, yeah, Tokyo. Wow. He won a bronze, and there's never been an Australian to win a gold medal at the yep. Olympics ever. And I think we have a really strong team. If it's, if it's not me, I hope it is me. But if it's someone else, like, I'm going to be freaking clapping so loud for them. And, yep. um, you know, I keep getting asked if I'm excited for the Olympics. And to be honest, I'm just exhausted. Yeah. It's been a long journey. It's been a lot of training, a lot of hard work, long days, early mornings. But I am really excited. Like, it'll be all worth it, like, come yeah. July 26, exactly a month away from today so amazing one month away and outside of boxing do you have a job are you working do you study <clears throat> yeah I worked um when I was yeah when I turned 18 I was sort of like what the hell am I going to do yeah lockdown I was working construction and I got a brain injury working on a job site so I sort of was like I need to have a career change started working at um now at Rangers for Andrew Land Council with like Ani Mandy and Kaya yeah. and all them and um sort of made my way into government. So I was working at Department of Premier and Cabinet um, in Heritage Policy, so yeah, wow. the administration of the Aboriginal Heritage Act. But I had to quit that job two months ago because training for the Olympics is hard. Yeah. I have a, had a few. Like it was just I couldn't work a full-time job and train full-time for the Olympics and travel with the, with the team. It was just way too much. So even now it's way too much. Yeah. So I got a few sponsors on board, which was such a relief because obviously Olympic athletes, like, we don't get paid a dollar. Like, yeah. it's it's really hard. But um, pure, pure passion. Exactly. What message or advice do you have 
for young Indigenous athletes who aspire to follow in your footsteps. If you love it and you're passionate about it, keep on going with it. And I think anything is possible. Like it just takes time, consistency and effort to to start achieving things you want to achieve. It's not going to happen overnight, but the time accumulates and, you know, all of a sudden you're like, all of a sudden you'll be going to the Olympics or you'll make the AFL or, you know, whatever it is you want to do. Even people that, even young black black athletes, like, so young black kids, like if it, even if it's not sport, Aboriginal people are more than just doing sport. Like yeah. if whether it's education, art, music, whatever it is, like you're s- capable of so much and if you want to do it, like you're going to be able to do it. Like Yeah. Going back to that, that success is never linear. So is that, um, something that you would really want out there in community for young people to know that that success is just never linear? I think as well as, like, success isn't, like, just achieving things. Like, yeah. it's, it's like, what it does for you as a person. I think, like, boxing has really given me, a three, like, a new chance at life. I'm, I feel like a completely different person to, like, maybe when you met me. I felt like I was... Just, I just felt like a very lost person and I think I think looking at like what it's doing for you as a person for your life like that is success like yeah. it doesn't have to like be in, in the form of gold medals or yeah. sporting accolades like and like success to me is an Olympic gold medal like I want to go to university and study yeah. and um, have stability and like have a, a beautiful family and all yeah. this stuff like it's just yeah, it's not just – there's more to life as well than getting hit in the head as well for me. So Yeah, that's a great thing to know too. Um, I suppose for young listeners and people who obviously aspire, you know, just are on that journey of finding themselves also, but then also finding out what their success looks like. Um, and success isn't always – I think even for myself was really, you know, as a young person but also started young um, playing footy is, you know – in making that AFLW level is that success isn't always necessarily in, in the accolades and things, but it can also be and what we want um, in life, stability, like you said, stability and, you know, and that's growth and that's small things, but in the long run in life and stuff, it's, you know, it's success as well in a different way. Yeah. So it's a great way to explain success too. Um, but thank you also for explaining that. Um Looking beyond the Olympics, what are your aspirations and plans like for future and stuff? Is there like a – you talked about study. Is there something you want to be or become? I think it just keeps on changing, but obviously from my, my work in land conservation and management, being on country, working yeah, in policy and government, like I was thinking like studying law and science, but I think now that I've been an athlete and I've dealt with a lot of bullshit <laughs> as yeah. an athlete, yeah. like – I don't know if I'd want to go into the like the law space advocating for athletes. Yeah. So I'm still tossing up, but yeah, definitely something in law for sure. Oh, that's amazing. And um advocating for others strongly. Um yeah, that's great, sis. And that's also an amazing thing to also celebrate. So yeah. I look forward to following your journey a bit more and obviously, yeah, seeing where you go. Um so this is your first Olympics. We're all very excited. Um, what are your hopes and goals in the, heading into the Olympics? I've just trained so hard. Like this is like the fittest I've ever been. Like my weight is on point. Like everything is just going well. I just can't wait to like be on the plane to Germany and get two weeks of hard sparring internationally and, you know, be on the train to Paris and get into the village and get my uniform on and like it will feel real and – um, you know, the opening ceremony, that's going to be, that's going to be like real, real. <laughs> it's going to yeah. feel legit, um, you know, and getting ready for comp like for the 1st of August, that's when my first bout is scheduled for, like just making sure my weight is all good. I'm feeling ready to go. And it's just all about the process for me. Like I take it day by day. And yep. um, if I get too caught up in, you know, what's, in the in the future, it's just got to just take it day by day. There's 30 days to go, and yeah. um, but yeah, so excited for you and yeah, your journey's been just amazing and what you could achieve and 
from, you know, your own passion and, you know, so, so very excited for you. So I feel like, you know, like a little kid watching Cathy again. So <laughs> it's exciting because it is history, history to be made. But um, yeah, so you are our first Aboriginal woman to go to the Olympics to represent Australia for boxing in your weight division. Um, so being a first of that, do you feel a little bit It's anxious? not pressure. It's yeah. just... It, it feels, like I said, like it's it's been positive. A lot of, like, you know, the the impact I've, you know, I've had on young people's lives, like, yeah. like is just beyond me. Like I never thought I'd be a role model to anybody. Um, yeah. I thought I was just going to, I don't know what I was thought I was going to end up as. But there's also, it's put, put like a bit of a target on my back as well. Like there's been a lot of hate. It's Sometimes it's hard to like not read the comment section. Um, a lot of abuse and harassment that's come mm. with that. And, like, it's really hard, but it also just adds fuel to my fire because I'm such yeah. a stubborn person. And I, like, just like doing things out of spite. I'm, I'm yeah. going to do it. Even <laughs> if you say I can't. Like, even if, like, di- like despite your disgusting views of and opinions of me, like, yeah. I'm, I'm very true to myself. I'm true to my story and... Um, I know I'm making my family and the people close to me very proud. Yeah. So. That's so wonderful, sis. And aren't we lucky that you are so staunch? Um, it's helped, you know, represent and get you to where you are today. So um, that's just so amazing. Uh, almost a bit starstruck for a second there. You say it's not a burden or anything being the first Aboriginal woman to go for boxing. Um, do you think the nostalgia when you get there, like when you see the torch and things like that, do you think a part of you will probably get a bit of goosebumps? I think so. Like it's yeah. not really hitting me now because, like like I said, I, I take things day by day and yeah. um, there's still a lot going on in my athlete life, in my personal life. Mm-hmm. But I think it's just going to be a really crazy experience to, like, put the green and gold on yep. and um, be in that, like, in that limelight and, yeah. Um, be a person that's, you know, spoken about publicly and as someone yeah. that's, you know, motivating a new generation of young people. And so, yeah, it's it's also it's also for me as well. Like yeah. it's like this is about me and my sacrifices and my commitment and my effort over, you know, the five years that I've been boxing. So yep. I'm also being as selfish as I can be. And just, oh, that's great. Yep. And doing this for me because yeah, I've fucking, it's for me. Yeah. I've trained my ass off for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so great. Oh, so excited for you. And just a quick one. Like I suppose when the Olympics comes, it's going to be out in the media. It's going to be out in the news, and you're going to hear a lot about the Olympics. Mm. Um, and people are probably going to ask you a lot of questions, knowing that you are the first Aboriginal woman going for boxing. Does things like social media and tuning off from social media and media help you? In your success? Girl, my notifications <laughs> are permanently off. My phone is on Do Not Disturb, like, yeah. 24-8. Like, I, like, refuse to look at my phone like it's my full-time job. Like, oh, yes. out of sight, out of mind. Like, I really, <laughs> I really used to, like, like be like, why do all these people hate me? Like, I don't understand what I've done. And, like, yeah. and obviously everyone wants a, a piece of you at the moment. Like, yep. it's the Olympics. Like, the me- momentum is well and truly built to the Olympics, like there's 30 days out, like everybody knows that Paris 2024 is happening. And yeah, um, yeah, it's been a lot. It's been a lot, but like I, get, like I just said, I just, I just need to be selfish and that's right. Yeah. Sort of regress a little bit, turn the phone off. Yep. Throw it in the ocean or something. I don't know. <laughs> Throw <Don't> away. <laughs> Literally. Bye. But nothing. Bye. Oh, that's great to know. So, like, just tuning off and do you read a book? Literally, like, I just, after a long day, I just, like, hug my family. I go upstairs. Yep. Shower. And then I'm just, like, vegging out, watching Law & Order. Got my, like, teddy next to me and just, oh, like. I love that. Not talking to anybody. Yeah. <laughs> we are not talking to anybody. <laughs> Come see me later. We l- I love that. So, Law & Order, you're watching Netflix. Yes. Yeah. Any other faves that you'll watch? Is there like something that you can watch that just you just tune out on, like a light watch? 
No, Law and Order is my light watch. That's the light watch. The theme song is like white noise to me. I'm like, honestly, any like form of rom com as well. Like I'll just like, I'll just be like, mm, this is so good. This like, is nice. Okay, this is what I want. Yeah. Well, there you go, guys. If you ever have something that's coming up and you just don't want to know about it, or if you need tools and strategies to be able to learn how to tune out, find your show. <laughs> Might be law and order. <laughs> Am yeah, I, I doubt it. It's, yeah. it's terrifying. But it helps me sleep. So <laughs> It helps Marissa. <laughs> it might not help other people or myself, but <laughs> that's so good. I love that. No, I'm so proud of you, sis, and um, how amazing, you know, representing and, yeah, and even just thank you for being able to share the space today. I know. I was so freaking surprised when I saw you because I have not seen you since I was, like, 15. I so. know. This has been amazing and we'll – we able to have like a proper hug after this, but I'm so, so proud of you and just your journey and how you've been able to obviously get to where you are today, but you're such an inspiration for myself and I'm sure for many generations after the Olympics, you know, you will be like up there with the Cathy. So, you know, all the other young Aboriginal women will be for many years to come, very proud of what you've been able to achieve. So, yeah, thank you, thank you for sharing the space today and having a yarn. It's been it's been lovely. And to connect again. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Like, the timing's just so weird, you know. Like, yeah. I think, yeah, it's never Bundle's law. It's always on purpose. Like, timing yeah. always is intentional. So yep. Yeah. That's right. It's always meant to be. Ancestors know what they're doing. Literally. Yeah. They know. <laughs> they know. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Thank you so much. And that is it for us on the National Indigenous Times. <laughs>